Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. And the first piece of science tonight is that it takes me longer than three minutes to eat a cheese sandwich. So, so excuse me while I just finish that off uh, during the first uh, five or so minutes of the stream. Um, I'm sure you didn't come here to watch me eat a cheese sandwich. So <laughs> my apologies for that. I had to feed the dog and then I thought I better get myself a sandwich because it's going to be late before I get to a chance to eat anything. So here we go. Um, so a quick, uh, quick recap of um, the chat before I kick into tonight. So good evening, everybody. Um, quite a few in the chat already. Uh, David, Adrian, Phil, uh, Russell, uh, Gary, James. Hi, James. Uh, Mark, uh, who else do we have? Uh, Mario, John Alec, good evening. Um, John Arthur, and I'm sure I've missed people, but good evening all. Thank you for joining me uh, to watch it, <laughs> me eat a cheese sandwich. Um, just for Gary, Gary T., so masking, masking and ripping off paint. Um, there's a few things. So one of the reasons actually that I've switched over now to outlaw paint is it doesn't do that. I've not had a sim single lifting of any paint using outlaw. Um, so primer is, is important. I find when masking stuff, you need a good base for your, your paint to go down on. And then it depends on the paint. Um, so acrylics will tend to lift more than others. Um, if you've got something like Tamiya or Hitaka or Vallejo or anything, you want to leave it, leave it at least a day um, after spraying before you try masking it to really give it time to cure. So it might dry, you know, quickly, but to really get like hard, uh, you need to give it a bit more time. Um, <clears throat> and then you need to be using the lightest tape you can for the shortest amount of time. So the longer you leave tape on, the, the worse it will be. Um, I mean, I found that with masking windows, never mind about like masking models. Um, and sometimes you will end up pulling paint off anyway. Uh, so lacquers tend to not suffer as much. So acrylics will generally suffer more than enamels, which will generally suffer more than lacquers. And it's because the hotter the paint is, the more it kind of chemically binds. Can you finish, Pablo? Shaking yourself noisily. Um, yeah, the more it kind of chemically bond, bonds to the the uh, plastic rather than forming a layer. So that's one of the reasons now that I'm just using lacquers wherever I can. Um, so interior stuff doesn't matter as much because you're generally not masking that anyway. Uh, but yeah. Uh, James, I was eating cold pizza earlier. Uh, that was my lunch. Uh, so I guess last night I had a, a pizza that Maria bought me. Before she went to Barcelona, so Maria was in Barcelona this week uh, visiting her sister. So I may do a few more streams than normal. I'm going to, I haven't got the shop open this week. Uh, I've got the shop closed all week. I'm just going to concentrate on producing content this week. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff to, to catch up on, um, finishing editing and getting it out, including the uh, who is the best model company in the world. So I have almost finished part one of that. It's going to be a two-part video um, with 100 model companies down to one winner. And I know the results already. But, um, yeah, the, I go from 100 to 12 in the first video um, through three rounds. And I'm trying to do it as objectively and scientifically as possible rather than just saying what I think. Um, so that's been quite an interesting process. And actually... Uh, the idea I had for it in the first place, I had like 15 model companies, I think I looked at. And as I got more into it, I thought, well, some of my choices here are a bit subjective. So really I ought to widen it out a bit before I go deep diving into to some of the stuff that I was looking at. And then I got to like 70 odd, like 73 companies, which is an odd number anyway. And I thought it needs to it needs to be like a nice round number, right? So like 75 or 80 or something. 
and a hundred isn't that far away. And a hundred is kind of the number that, you know, it covers most of the companies that you'll have, not all of them. Um, but in doing that, I kind of had to reset kind of like, okay, I've been going down kind of, not down the rabbit hole, but I've been doing some of the detail work on some of those like 15 and then 18 companies and then went out to the larger uh, bit and I thought I need to reset and actually think about this. And once you actually start thinking about what makes a model company good, you know, what makes it great? And, you know, I go through some of that in the video of the choices that I've made because it's going to be different for, for everybody, but I kind of had to make some, in, in any sort of scientific hypothesis, if you like, uh, if you're going to do testing, you need to form some sort of, of hypothesis. So uh, you need to have some parameters that you choose and then test against them. So other people's choices may be different. I've tried, as I said, to be as objective as I can and not allow my personal bias to come in. Um, but there are some companies that I originally started working with, uh, or working on, I should say, that haven't made it through into the final now. So the 12 companies that I'm going to be looking at aren't the same 12 companies or 15 companies that I, that I started looking at. So the majority of them are, you know, the obvious ones kind of, but some of the obvious ones didn't make it, um, which, which I found interesting. You know, I think it's interesting when you go in and look at something objectively, how your own kind of bias and expectations can actually be like, oh, well, kind of was, I was wrong about that. So I think that that's going to be, um, I mean, it's been an interesting video for me to, to put together. So I want to finish that off, try and get that out. It won't be tomorrow, obviously, because we've got Airfix and Chill. So I'll probably do that for Tuesday. And I'll try and follow up um, on the second part as quickly as possible. I'd like to get it for Saturday if I can, uh, for next weekend. Um, am I going to upset Moss? Well, <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I did the video on Airfix, right? So, you know, if that ship has sailed. <laughs> uh, and Moss, Moss and I, you know, we respect each other's opinions. I think we both know. Um, why each other have i mean moss is an airfix fanboy in the best way you know he likes airfix and what they've been doing he's got that history with them and stuff um and he freely admits that so you know i think he sees the faults in them as well um and he wants the best for them as well i, I want the best for them i want them to to fix some of their logistic issues you know and uh, and create more kits than they than they are doing and hit the subjects that we all want um, so yeah, it, it's, I don't think we are unaligned at all. Um, so I hope I don't upset us. I don't think I will. Um, but speaking of airfix, I have a few things here. I just want to show you before I kind of get into tonight. Airfix, the fairy Rotterdine. <laughs> I was thinking about doing a video on this, like rotten Rotterdine. There's a lot you can do with, with this. Um, so Nunu at Plastic uh, Alchemist, uh, the Plastic Alchemist uh, on his channel, I think he did it on live streams, built this kit. Um, he he struggled with it. It is not an easy build as far as I as I know. I looked through it. It's very 1960s Airfix. Um, I don't know if I'm going to do a video on it or not. Um, maybe. Maybe I want to do something on like vintage kits and stuff. But will I build it? I mean, they only have made one, right? It's it's kind of one of those things. And I think that demonstrates one of those points that I made in that, you know, um, 10 things Airfix need to do to be truly successful video is, and I mentioned it on uh, Airfix and Chill last week, was the boldness. You know, they made one fairy Rotterdam, and Airfix made a model of it. I mean, Airfix made thousands, thousands more Airf fairy Rotterdams than fairy did. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I mean, it's covered in raised rivets, um, the doors at the back, so it's got opening doors at the back, I mean, it's like a <laughs> great big chunks to go, to kind of accommodate the, the opening bit, it, it doesn't look great, the pilots are very sitting on the toilet, um, although they are in sort of RAF officer's uniform. They're kind of very civilian pilot of the time. Um, 
and there's there's no real internal detail at all, even in the cockpit. Uh, I didn't have any breakages on mine. I know a lot of people, um, and I think I mentioned this. Actually, I don't think I did. I think I was talking to this about uh, a group of modelers that came into the shop. Um, but this this sprue here, and look how, how sprues have evolved. You know, um, you know now we, we are used to the frame. You know, we call them sprue frames for a reason, <laughs> because they have a frame. Whereas this, you know, the, I mean, look at it. It's like wobbling about like nobody's business. And obviously, what's on the outside? Your nice breakable propellers. And a lot of people were reporting that these were broken. This wasn't. But what I found really interesting, because uh, I didn't get these for quite a while in the shop. I think they came in like a few weeks ago. I don't know if this is going to come up very well on this camera because of the, the sort of high contrast of the of the light. If I can change this a little bit. See if I can turn that light down a bit so it... Can you see that? Ah, there. See how the light... Can you see how there are two different seals? So I'm wondering if the batch I got... Oh my God. Well, I'll leave it like that, actually, because I'm not too washed out there. I'm wondering if these, this batch, the reason they got kind of delayed a bit, is I wonder if Airfix checked them. Um, and these are, you know, they checked them and then they resealed them because these are two different, completely different widths of seal. So I think that's an interesting, an interesting thing. Um, I mean, that's a spot fix, right? So as I talked about in my video, these things need to change. But that is not the solution. That's a short term sticking plaster, right? Because that costs a lot to open kits, to check them, and then put them back. Doing QC in the UK, that's not great. Anyway, a couple of other things. Uh, I had a whole bunch of Italieri kits come in. Or Italieri, Italieri. I can't, still can't force myself to it. And I got this, which is one of my most recent toolings, the AMX Ghibli. Um, this, I thought it would be quite, quite nice to look at, a very recently tooled 72nd scale um, Italieri kit, because I did look at the, uh, the Fulgori, which is a nice kit, overpriced, but a nice kit. This, I think, is probably the same. Um, so I was looking, I got a whole bunch of Italian kits in. You can buy, I can't remember exactly what they are, but like the Yemi 109 G6, I think it is, and they do a Spitfire Mark V, which I think are late 90s toolings. Which I mean, they're perfectly acceptable. Um, around a tenner, like ten or eleven pounds. Um, they do a uh, JU eighty seven G two, I think it is, Canon Vogel. Uh, that is about thirteen. You know, that's a reasonably sized aircraft. This is over twice that. So RRP, I think this is thirty pounds, and it's not a big aircraft. You know, it's a little light attack aircraft. So. I think that might be an interesting one to look at. Um, this, I have John Alec to blame. If you're still in the chat, John, it's your fault. <laughs> but this, uh, John will know, I used to have one of these because I sent him a picture of it. Because we're both fans of, of Japanese sports cars. Um, this is the Tamiya GTO, Mitsubishi GTO. Um, I had one of these and I loved it and I regret selling it. Um, I bought it for a princely sum of £425 because the gearbox was broken. Um, it wouldn't go into second, or third, or reverse. So you had to drive it from first and then change into fourth. But because the engine can rev, so Japanese engines tend to rev really high. Um, so you could you could drive it in first and then change straight into fourth, and it was fine. Um, manual gearbox, mine was, which is pretty unusual. Most of them are automatics. Japanese import, obviously. You didn't make them here. Um you call it the spaceship. It was like it's six feet wide, this thing. It, and I live in rural Wiltshire at the time. It was <laughs> the roads were a bit of a squeeze. Um, the gearbox actually, all that was wrong was it was a cotter pin had come out of one of the linkages. So it cost me about 20p to fix it. Um, beautiful, beautiful car. 
Mine was silver. Uh, it had different alloys on. I put aftermarket alloys on. So I want to do this as a Japanese. Um, there's actually a group build uh, that John Alec kind of introduced me to with his Aoshima. Um, oh, what's it called? Can't remember the exact car. Something 2000. It's a Toyota. Um, check that out. Um, check his channel out. John Alec is a fine man. And uh, he's a very generous guy. And I did put a post up trying to give some of that love back. Um, so do check out his, his build. It's a really nice build of the uh, Toyota. Um, what scale is that? That's a 124th, I believe. I think the most of the Tamiya kits, yeah, 124th. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly sizable kit and pretty reasonable. Uh, I mean, this was... Oh, what did I pay? I can't remember what the retail price is. Like twenty pounds? I don't think it's even twenty pounds. Um, I mean, yeah, it's. What I'm going to try and do is find an STL of the alloys that I had, or make the alloys in in something in three D and then three D print them. Whether I'll be able to do that, I don't know, but really, really nice. <laughs> James, yes, uh, I'm glad it arrived. It all, uh, all came in, in one piece, then, or rather, 1,171 parts. <laughs> We're talking about a mini art kit that uh, that I sent to uh, to James on uh, on John Alex's behest. A uh, Panzer 3C with 1,171 parts. I mean, a Panzer 3C in 35th scale is smaller than this. <laughs> so enjoy that, James. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing before I get into this is um, I got to take a small bite of sandwich. Otherwise, it's going to go stale. This beast. Now, this is obviously the monogram obviously although it's boxed Ravel it's the monogram 148 b17g as he whacks his microphone apologies for that a huge huge beast and that's, that's the fuselage massive massive great thing I've already sprayed uh, zinc chromate primer inside. Outlaw zinc chromate primer, of course. And not a subject I'm going to commit heresy here for you US viewers. I'm not a big fan of the Flying Fortress. Um, I mean, I think what the 8th Air Force did and, uh, you know, the US in World War II was absolutely incredible, amazing. But the actual aircraft itself, yeah. You know, I much prefer the B twenty nine um, Super Fortress. I think that's a that's a cool, much more innovative aircraft. Um, B seventeen to me just looks too nineteen thirties, um, and it was a hell of a lot of plane to carry not that very many bombs. Um, but the reason I'm doing it is it's actually a commission by the local uh, Wincanton um, History uh, Group. And they want me to build it as a uh, B-17G called Old Faithful, um, which <laughs> ironically uh, crashed, <laughs> actually crashed into a farm just down the road from the shop. I, I didn't realize. Um, killed everybody on board. Basically, it was went over to, uh, I think it was towards Saint-Nazaire in France, 1944, did a raid was hit by flak in a number three engine. There's actually a photograph of it returning with like, you know, I don't know, hydraulic fluid or fuel or something coming out of the number three engine. They were going to take it to Spain, but that obviously would mean they would be interned and spend the rest of the war there because they're neutral, obviously. Um, and they decided, no, we're going to try and make it back uh, to Zeals in, um, in the UK. And just before Wincanton, um, that flak, um, on the number three engine, it obviously hit the structure, the internal spar, and the wing ripped off. Um, it kind of just crashed and exploded into a farm, unfortunately, killing everybody on board and uh, a bunch of, I think it was children on the ground. Um, 
So they want me to do this as a, to sit in the museum, obviously, to commemorate that. There is a, a little plaque uh, there as well. Uh, but I thought that was quite an interesting uh, interesting piece of history that I wasn't aware of, uh, which is always very cool. I think it's, uh, I think tying modeling into kind of basing into reality, you know, is a, a very cool kind of, you know, thing. It's, it's one of the things, as I've mentioned before, many streams that I find really interesting about the hobby. Okay, that brings me to this. So this package uh, was delivered uh, a little while ago, and I haven't opened this because I thought, no, I'm going to do it on, on stream so you can actually see it. Um, <laughs> thank you for the... <laughs> I mean, post people should know, really, right? Don't crush things. <laughs> but, they, you know, extra instruction is always good. Uh, so this is the Fairy fly Firefly. Um, made by Frog. Uh, it's actually a 1972 kit. Um, the the boxing here is actually not the original boxing. It was reboxed in 1974. Uh, the original boxing, well, the two boxings was a boxing and a bag. You know the old um, bags that used to hang. Uh, in 72, and two years later they reboxed it with I think better cover art. So the cover art on here is the one that kind of persisted up until the present day. And that's because the uh, the frog molds, uh, maybe actually, quick rewind. So frog, for those of you who don't know, is older than Airfix. Um, frog actually started, I think, in 1931. Um, it's also not a company. Um, so frog is actually a brand of... Um, Lines Brothers, I believe it was, um, and Triang, as, as they became. And Frog was a brand, and it actually, Frog is a an acronym that stands for Flies Right Off the Ground. And the first kits they made were, were flying kits. And then they um, basically made a range of, I think, cellulose acetate uh, molded kits so they weren't like styrene to start with people moved over to styrene quite rapidly because cellulose acetate was a bit crap um but they moved over to, to well they didn't move over they started doing static kits because obviously it started catching on and uh that was the penguin the frog penguin range and obviously the reason that they were penguins because penguins don't fly so i thought that was quite interesting um but they lasted until, not long actually, until uh, when this kit was made in the late 70s. I think it was 77. I may, may be wrong on that, but it was around that time, 76, 77. Um, they went into receivership and the, the all the frog injection molds uh, were interestingly ended up uh, being sold to Novo or Novo bought them or how it worked back then. I think it's interesting because, I mean, 19, it was 1976, that was it, because I remember when doing the research for it, um, it was the summer that we had a really, really, it was a really hot summer. We had a heat wave in the UK, uh, which I remember, even though being a really little kid, um, I remember, like, my mum, like, lying in the bath all day, because, <laughs> you know, just in cold water, it was that kind of hot. And uh, we had a big plague of ladybirds, that was... <laughs> because of the heat and other things. Anyway. So if you think at that time, that was, it wasn't the height of the Cold War, but it was pretty bad. So for a, so, I mean, it was a Soviet com company then, Novo, it wasn't Russian, it was part of the Soviet Union. Um, so how British molds ended up being sold to a Soviet country, or you know, to the Soviet Union, I don't know. I don't know enough about that. I think that's quite interesting. Um, but then it was sold quite a lot as Novo, and then it went everywhere. I mean, there were a bunch of Soviet companies and then now Russian companies. I think the last issue of it was like 2018 or so. Um, I think with the same artwork that you're going to see on this box in a minute. So uh, just let me 
go back to the chat and just see if I've missed anything there during my rambling. Uh, saw some sprue shots of the FX Liberator. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it looks like it's going to be an impressive kit. Uh, we won't see it for a while, though. Uh, yeah, so quality, you know, again, going back to the ethics thing, QC is really important, right? Um, I think I've mentioned before on live streams, I used to work for a Japanese company. Japanese are... I mean, they are the best at QC. They they basically started off things like the Toyota way, which has worked its way into most modern companies. Um, you know, you'll hear Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma. Um, I work for a couple of companies, one American company that really championed those, a company called Danaher, uh, I've mentioned before. Um, they have something called the, the Danaher Business System. Uh, other companies I've worked for have adopted similar things. Um, it's not unique, it's just using all of the tools that the Japanese kind of produced. Double handling is actually one of the six wastes. Um, I think it's the six wastes? Or the seven wastes? I don't know. It's a long time since I've done the training. Um, but yeah, double handling, double, you know, you've got to try and eliminate all of those things um, because it's just wasted money. Uh, just going down, I answer the question about scale and parts. Uh, sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, take care of yourselves. Um, heart attacks are. Well, there are two things that are most likely to kill you. Um, heart attacks or, you know, some sort of, of heart condition or cancer. Those are the two biggest things, biggest um, killers in the Western world, at least. Um, something's going to get you. Um, but, uh, you know, at that point, really, you've got to think about the people left behind. Because um, for that person, you know, with cancer, typically, not always... But generally, you know, it's a it's a fairly predictable end, at least. You know, uh, heart conditions you know, they can happen; they tend to be quick, so which can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. Right? Uh, my father died of cancer. Um, it was very rapid uh, from actually finding out him dying, and um, yeah, and very rapid at the end. Um, so I think I think I might have seen it further down um, about Hobby Barn. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, senior, also known as Hobby Barn, um, passed away uh, a little while ago. So you've seen there was a, a shout out for end of life care for him from the GoFundMe. Um, he has passed now, which I think retrospectively, you know. The longer these things go on, the harder it is for everybody involved. So I think um, provided it was, I mean, it was you know, predicted. It was um, known about. He had the people who, who loved him around him. So um, there are a few things you can ask for more um, than that kind of passing. But yeah, thoughts certainly go out to, to the family at the moment. Uh, what else have we got? Liberated J will be 148 scale. Oh, good God. Who's making that? Oh, here we go. Hobby Boss. No, I've been... So one of the other things, um, and one of the reasons that I'm, I, I want to have a, a clear week this week for video production, other than the stuff I've got in Backlog, is Hobby Boss... Well, Zhang Cheng Yatai, the Hobby Boss Trumpeter I Love Kit. We're all part of the same thing. Um... Their catalogs are due for release now. You know, um, last year it was around the 28th, I think, 23rd, 28th, something like that. So they're kind of overdue. Um, we had a sneak, like, release kind of in January. Um, somebody got a photocopied page or something. But 
you know, we want to see the full catalog because they, they throw out a ton of stuff. Um, so at the moment, no, we don't know about release dates. Hobby Boss, Trumpeter, I'd have kept Chinese manufacturers generally don't give you release dates. It's not like Airfix who, you know, I can tell you pretty much what month each of the Airfix kits. I mean, I can't tell you because it's all under the, the Airfix uh, terms and conditions. So you're not supposed to tell people. But um, I know when those are predicted. Um, obviously, production things can change that. Things can overrun. But you don't get that from, you know, Hobby Boss. <laughs> you get them when you get them. But a 48 scale Liberator is, uh, that's a big old beast. Alrighty. So let me swing these lights around. If I can find the release, uh, which of course is on top, just to make it difficult for me. make sure it's tight because one thing I always do is not do it tight enough so then I have to do it twice which is double work which as we've just discussed <laughs> is one of those wastes which we don't want all right and let's get you down to the bench now as we're here and as you can see, Pablo, he, Pablo keeps bothering me because he's after my sandwich. There you go. You eat that bit then. So I'm now finishing my sandwich. You still don't have to look at it, but apologies. Well, I talk and eat. We'll come to that <coughs> in a second. If I don't choke myself first. Um, I also put a post out, um, you probably have seen, this is the 3D print for the nozzles for the F-15, which came out super nice. I believe John Alec has the same nozzles that he printed out, uh, and these are just, this was printed fine first time. I've removed these, obviously just, I just use a razor saw to cut these off, these are rough at the moment, they haven't been um, trimmed or sanded, but the detail on them uh, and to come out you know first time on a print they've got really nice little location lugs uh, which i can't actually see here there we go they go on these uh whichever way it goes i can't remember i think it's like that i see the way I think it's kind of like this but just super nice give a ton more detail and uh it was only like a two hour print or like two and a half hours it's like super super fast i was very impressed with that so so i need to get those finished to crack on with that f15 but you can see i've I've got some prep here, <laughs> a bunch of plaster card, um, some reheat seats. Uh, not that I'm <laughs> like suspicious of what the frog kit might contain. Uh, I haven't looked at the frog kit other than when it was produced at all. I haven't uh, like looked at the instructions or anything. So this is, this is all you. What are you doing, Pablo? That. What I don't want to do is cut the cut the blocks. wrap presents at Christmas so nobody can get into things. <laughs> All right. First layer. Oh, a note. That's always good.
Thank you very much, Adrian. So yes, uh, Vstrom is the, uh, the chap who sent me this. The handle of the chap, I should say. So found this in his garage while clearing some stuff out and uh, sent it over to me, which is very kind. I'm sure I've not left anything in there. And here it is. Wow, that box has been through something. That's uh, a slug has eaten that, hasn't it? <laughs> so, interestingly, you know, they could they could do top opening boxes, you know, decent top opening boxes back then. Um, of course, Frog has put the colour marking guide on the back there. Look how that sellotape, the um, the adhesive in the tape has has yellowed the acid in that. And okay, that just peels off. There we go. Okay, interesting. And of course, the sky base. Now that's a very 1970s, 1960s, 70s font, isn't it? That's like early 70s, you know, kind of it's got those kind of cues from the 60s, but it's kind of getting more 70s. Action display stand. You know, taking off in flight, diving, banking. <laughs> Although I never really got these. It's like you're supposed to attach it to the wall or something. It's like, <laughs> but anyway. So yeah, the um, I say this particular box was that it was there was only one boxing of of it like this. So uh, this is quite a unique piece, and it's the last frog boxing as well. So after this, um, I say they went out of business, and uh, it, all the molds were moved to Novo. So um, so this is quite a piece of history, really. And yes, absolutely, uh, already better than Ravel. Um, well, and interestingly enough, right, this enormous, okay, this thing, right, this is, let me just open it, look, it's, it's, it's top opening. Not only that, it's really, really sturdy. Look at that. It's got these fold-out pieces so that you can um, you know, get all the stuff out. So Ravel have gone backwards <laughs> in terms of that. Also, I looked at the BV222, uh, the original one that I had. Again, it's a top-opening box, and that was in the early noughties. So, yeah. Okay, I'm going to do this so you guys can see it rather than me. Yeah, maybe I should do a 10 things Ravel need to do to sort themselves out. I'm not sure 10 is enough. So this is, uh, yeah, a real piece of nostalgia, I'm sure, for many of us. This is what my dad introduced me to in terms of, of models in Airfix and and frog um he never really liked frog he always thought airfix was better um but we still did frog stuff and novo you know he also didn't like and i guess obviously it was you know soviet then um but actually if you look at the way that the, the frog instructions are laid out i think this it was way ahead of its time um you know you've got very similar to modern instructions, you know, boxed pieces showing you clearly each stage. Um, and they're pretty good, you know, drawings for the time. So I think this is actually far superior to a lot of the stuff that came after from Airfix and Ravel. Um, 
So I think in terms of instructions, they were really kind of ahead of their time there. However, just looking at this, I can see, as expected, there is really nothing um, in the way of, of interior. Not that you will see an awful lot. Um, it doesn't even look like you get an instrument panel. Okay, I thought you would get an instrument panel, but obviously you did not. <laughs> Alrighty, interesting. So this is, I remember this, like how to, to stipple, you cut off the end of your, your brush and you can do you know, motley effects. I wonder if people still know about that, you know? Because this, this is actually not a bad technique at all. You know, how to apply your glue. Uh, I wouldn't say this is correct. I would say, you know, put it on something else and use something to put it on there is correct. But it was a different time. And painting pieces on the sprue. <laughs> and, of course, the, uh, the flight stand. Marking out your, <laughs> your camouflage with a pencil. Not sure we would really do that now, but of course you were using enamel paints, so um, probably wouldn't be an issue. I, I must admit, I never ever did that, even as a you know as a younger model. And of course, you have the the little history of the fairy firefly all the way through. Firefly is quite an interesting aircraft, actually. Um, by all accounts, I mean, it was massively late, right? It was, I think, commissioned in like 1936 or so, well before the war. It was seen as a, you know, a need. And um, it just took ages to develop, so it didn't enter service until like 43, I think it was. First flew in 38, I think. Um, but quite a, a robust aircraft. So it served in... Uh, a lot of the post-war stuff like Malaya and uh, the Malaya Uprising was used a lot by the Australians. Uh, the fleet air on, I think, actually gave some of the Australians theirs because they were in anti-submarine duties and they wanted some ground attack. It was quite a capable ground attack aircraft. Um, you know, it had four 20mm cannons. Uh, it could carry rockets. Um, and it proved to be quite resilient to um, anti-aircraft fire. So... And of course, back then, when we didn't know, plastic bags can be dangerous. So we'll come to that in a second. The interesting thing I thought was that there are two sets of decals here. Uh, and this actually, I re this is one of the things that you forget and then you come back to. Oh, did the first prototype fly in 43? All right. Um, is I remember getting like double sets of, of decals, you know, just because the QC obviously wasn't that um, wasn't that great. These actually don't look bad. So I have seen. So if you look from here, you have Canadian Canadian ones. It it doesn't come out very well on the camera there. To be honest, it doesn't come out that well looking at it in person. Um, but I have seen ones where these are massively out of register. But the red is like well shifted over. So these actually look like pretty decent ones. Uh, there's also not really any yellowing there. So I think we definitely have to try these. What are you doing, Pablo? What's the matter? You might want to go out. Ah, look at that. <laughs> that that colour is um, very much of its time, isn't it? Sort of repulsive, um, like oversaturated RM65. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can imagine a 1970s sink being, you know, like toilet suite being in this colour. <laughs> it's, um, well, it's something. 
And of course, that great thing of like just shoving the rather hideous uh, transparencies, just just chuck them in, chuck them in with everything else. There's a lot of flash on that. Uh, and this old um, transparent plastic was pretty brittle, as I recall. I'm going to get the sexy gogs a second. Just to see if there's. So this. I need to sort this light out here. There we go. That's better. Just make sure I've got all the light we can. There. So the. Clarity. I mean, this I think is one of the the things that you can really tell about modern kits. If you look at the the clarity of um, transparent pieces today, it's so much better. You also got really thick frames. I mean, really thick. You have an F294 Firefly. Tiny, tiny little sprue. This is part 11 that's come off. And, you know, you often get these, these broken, horrible injection gates. You can see that. My camera really doesn't want to focus on that. I have actually a, ca uh, a camera coming from a company uh which is designed for close-up work so i got an account with screen uh, streaming up allows me two cameras so when that comes i should be able to get much better detail shots for, for live streaming which will be great let's just see oh. modern single-bladed nippers so much better because that's really got rid of that um that nasty burr i mean not on the bottom but i'd file that rather than cutting it i mean this part's actually i mean it's obviously over thick for 170 second scale but it's it's not massively thick it's quite it doesn't feel very strong <laughs> um and it has some horrible optical qualities, which you, you will not be able to see here. Um, but the density of this plastic really changes. Now, one of the things I couldn't find, I was trying to find it before um, before the stream, is I have a bunch of Vacform canopies from Falcon, who are a, a company based from New Zealand. Still going today. Um, you can buy them in the UK through Hanant's. I'm not sure about the US, but I'm sure they supply them there. Obviously, in Australia and stuff, they can come direct from, from Falcon. Uh, and they are super superior to these. Um, think about the Firefly. It has this slightly blown um, front cockpit, which, I mean, this is it's the right shape, obviously, but it just looks horrible with the, the way that it's... Um, really thickly molded and a lot of optical distortion and i think this more than anything else is probably what lets down kits of this sort of age so i couldn't find the ref one i have but i was pretty sure that i have replacement vacuum canopies for this if not i do have a vacuum machine and i might actually vacuum my own Let's have a look at the plastic. <laughs> okay. So I, I'm going to do a bit of a direct comparison here. <laughs> right. Here's the Rossidine. This is the Ethics Spro 
that they were, and I'm just talking now not about the actual like molding or anything like that, but just in terms of the sprue design. Again, you know, Frock were really ahead. You know, they've got a, a complete frame here rather than this thing. Um, you know, so straight away, you know, the pieces are, you know, there's no damage or any of these, none of these are detached. Um, I've actually got quite fine casting on these as well, these exhausts here. Raised panel lines, of course, um, although pretty subtle. And uh, yeah, just solid, solid pieces like there. Solid piece at the back there where the radiator sits. Okay, so you do actually have a little bit of detail on the back shelf here. So the Firefly, I was wondering actually if this had it and it doesn't. The kind of where the radio operator sits, it kind of sits there and then he's got like a, a little bit that goes around like a shroud. And then he has a radio set in front of him. This stuff is at the back. Um, I think that's the way they've got it because this looks like because it's one large set, which they haven't represented. And in fact, of course, there's no seats. <laughs> that's, it's just the the floor is is the seat. <laughs> Such was a is a simpler time. <laughs> uh, those are the wheel up um, and the garage, and these are the wheels down. Okay, these are almost coming off the sprue, but let's just put them out of their misery so they don't tear chunks out. Oh, that come out anyway. Okay. I will say one thing. Airfix were way ahead in pilots. Those are really horrible. I mean, they are barely mannequins. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that, but oh my God. Those are terrible. I've got a little fly gang around there. But on the other hand, I mean... Okay, this control column isn't great, right? It, it doesn't really look like a control column for what was in the aircraft. But actually, the casting on it is really, you know, it's not bad, and it's very clean. There's no flash on those. So actually, this is not bad. The Firefly also had a really strange um, wing fold mechanism, which isn't represented on here, obviously. Um, I'm trying to think, it, it folded like here, but it folded from the back, like these bits came back. So, I mean, it was really narrow, you know, obviously done to maximize the number of aircraft that you could get in the, uh, in the carrier. Um, but it really didn't look very strong. <laughs> So yeah, there is a bit of flash on on these parts. You have your little bits to drill if you want to put the rockets on. The cannon there, which again, they are not badly, you know, they're big shrouded cannons, but you have the little barrels at the end there. Again, not bad. Uh, the trailing edges obviously are pretty thick. That kind of shows some of the, the constraints of, of the technology of the time. These ones aren't too bad. But yeah, it's um, pretty interesting. I mean, okay, let me just move these out of the way for a second. If you look at you know, this is a pretty fine piece. It is quite delicate. 
for the uh, arrestor hook. Again, not particularly very accurate, but um, I mean, same goes with the landing gear. Quite nice, nicely cast. You know, there's no no flash there at all. And if we are comparing it to to Airfix, you know, this is what I meant about the kind of civilian pilot there, very um, 1960s kind of civilian XRAF. But I mean, only I mean, okay, I get that this has been through a lot more imprints. This has not had a lot of impressions on it compared to this. Um, but just the way that it's attached and things, you know, most of these just have single attachment points. Whereas here, they generally on the frame with a couple of, of points. And of course, that helps with things like short shots. Um, it helps the plastic flow. And just in terms of finesse of parts, look how thick those airfix parts are compared. Well, let's take the equivalent, the landing gear. Look at those two landing gear side by side. As my dog goes mad at something. You know, these main landing gear compared to... Okay, let's not say these ones, because maybe the Rotterdine landing gear were really chunky, but the front one, even. Right. I shall leave you looking at that, while I'm going to try and find out what the hell is wrong with my dog. <laughs> Right, sorry about that. <laughs> as long as hints are the only things he's dropping, I don't mind. <laughs> right, let me just... Uh... I'm not sure if 70s counts as antique, John. Otherwise, I think a fair few of us come under that. <laughs> Maybe we are. Ah! Mr. Surfacing, Mr. Surf, Mr. Finishing Surface of 1500 Black. Um, I imagine it's usually because there are uh, a few points of, there are a few importers, and they tend to all get stock, you know, from Japan at the same kind of time. Um, I actually have a supply now doing uh, Mr. Hobby products, and um, I will have. When it comes into stock, I'm not sure what's on my order, actually. Um, but Mr. Finishing Surfacer in various different grades and colours will be coming in. But as to when, not sure. Yeah, uh, uh, it is. Uh, it, it's a very easy thing to say, right? keep it simple stupid um and things like lean six sigma the toyota way kaizen continuous mindset improvement that is you know ichikawa diagrams the Pareto rule all of these things sound really you know fancy and technical but it's not they basically boil down to common sense you know as it used to be um you know you you don't do things your customers don't like you don't do things your employees don't like. Um, you use the the simplest route to things. It's the Occam's razor thing, you know. But yeah, I mean, raised rivets obviously were a thing, and these are relatively subtle as raised rivets go. But the surface different, the finish difference here. And again, I know I'm not comparing eggs with eggs because this has been through a lot more. It's modern injection and all that kind of stuff. Modern plastic, let's see, in an old mold. And we don't know what's been done to this. 
um, versus an original mold, but this is pretty impressive for the time. So let's put the ethics kit to one side. I can hear Pablo is back in, so I'm going to go and get him, and then I'll crack on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I apologize to anybody else who has a dog. I completely understand that. If Pablo could hear any other dogs, he would also be going absolutely mental. <laughs> Pablo is so antisocial that, uh, I mean, with us, he's absolutely lovely because obviously we're his pack. But anybody that isn't in that, he, he was he's a rescue. He wasn't socialised. We've had him a couple of years. He has got better. Um, but it's a relative thing because he was absolutely dreadful. Um, but if he hears a dog or even sees a dog on TV, he thinks that's real and, you know, intruding into his territory, <laughs> which is always an interesting, interesting thing. This is actually quite nice plastic to work with, actually. Cuts. It's quite similar, actually, to modern Airfix plastic. Or ICM plastic. You know, it's it's quite... Soft is not the word I want to use. But, in fact... I'll give you a quick sneak preview of the, the second video in the what's the best kit in the world. I actually bought a hardness tester to test how hard plastic is because, again, me just saying, you know, this plastic is softer than this and I prefer this, that's subjective, right? Whereas if I actually test the actual hardness of plastic, <laughs> that's definitive. So that's the kind of stupid lengths I have gone to for the video. So I just wanted to, to take these parts off, just the fuselage and those uh, internal, I won't call them cockpit because they're not really, <laughs> I'm just going pieces. I just want to see what you actually kind of get here, kind of how it looks. Okay, so one of the things that we have come a long way on is fit, like how things fit together. And that is what my dad never liked about frog kits. And I can see why. <laughs> it's a little ambiguous, to say the least. I mean, there are no connecting points at the top at all. I mean, none, just literally none. All you're getting are these lugs at the front. And that's it. <laughs> that literally is it. That's the only actual solid attachment point in the entire model. I mean, I guess you're using the, the rear here as the next one. I mean, a fair play. It aligns really well. <laughs> but that's lucky because if it didn't you'd be absolutely screwed <laughs> okay so the, the cockpit such as it is it just makes it hard now with what I actually want to do so let's just use some of these little um, holding clamps because what I want to try and do is Look at what we have kit wise, kit part wise, which ain't that easy with the way that this is molded. 
because this kind of piece here, which is supposed to be the seat, right? That just, that tab goes onto that piece at the back there. That is, that is the seat. So I think rather than that, and I suspected this was the case, right? Because most kits of that era tended to be that way. And I have these in themselves relatively old. These are like 25 years old. Um, these are reheat sets. Uh, I don't think reheat exists anymore. This is their World War II RAF accessory set. Um, so you get various etched brass seats, uh, pedals, these pieces here and those are parts of the pedals as well which are really fiddly you have probably can't see very well let's put it on there uh, you've got seat belts you have ammo belts which you won't need here and then you have all sorts of things like you've got little rear view mirrors for fighters you have these sights um, and compasses. These are compasses. And what else do we have? Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, I must admit, I've not used these tiny, tiny pieces because I hate this kind of stuff. <laughs> if you don't have a definitive place for it, it's really difficult to use. I tend to use the seats and the belts and they were pretty cost effective at the time I think these were like a few pounds maybe five pounds but you got what one two three four five like six sets of belts three seats all the, the pedals and stuff compasses which are pretty cool but fiddly as hell and the ammo belts are useful as well so I will probably use a couple of these you know these ones that are the same and then just make a floor and also, as we don't have anything in the front at all, um, some sort of instrument panel here. Then in the back, what do we get in the back? Where does this go? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I was right on the where this piece goes and which is the rear and which is the front. although it's not being very compliant. So this little tab goes in. Obviously, if you're gluing it, it's these where it's supposed to, whilst doing this, but... Okay, this is obviously in the way now. Let's move that there. So this piece here at the back actually gives us a good a good baseline what it's missing is there was a piece here that kind of like a shelf almost this carried on around and scooped around so there's a like a flat piece here and that had a big radio on um, and then the seat kind of well, it's in the right place, the, the floor for the seat. Um, but really, you could only see that seat and this this piece. So missing that out is a is a bit of an omission because that was definitely visible. So actually, because you can't see too much, you know, it's one seventy second scale as well. We don't have a bad baseline there, but I think probably a plastic hard shelf along here, replacing that. Um, radio set at the front and then two seats again same here i'm not going to use this piece at all i don't think i think i'll just 
make the floor because that actually goes to the back there. So yeah, I think I won't bother. I'll make a floor for it instead. Because it is a pretty tight cockpit. It's 172nd scale. So once you've got a seat with some belts on, and at least some facsimile of a uh, of an instrument panel there, I think we're good. The fit of this is really super vague as well. The, pit, the parts don't really fit. <laughs> there is about a millimeter play, maybe a little bit more. So that tab at the bottom is fully engaged. And that one isn't even touching. <laughs> yeah, it, the tolerances are not great. But if that gets in there, yeah. I think what I might do is cut this because that's doing nothing there really so align this properly at the top this obviously needs cleaning up as well because it's a big I don't know if you can see that a big ejector pin mark right on top and then use this as where we're going to put that shelf and let me just see if I can let me show you in fact I might just use that as the guideline of where to put the shelf and put it all the way across. Let me show you if I can work out how to do that again. It's always annoying present, isn't it? Here we go. So you can see this is this is what the Fairy Firefly um, interior looks like 48 scale um, aftermarket. I mean, this is the actual thing. You can see there you've got this, this shelf, which is basically um, the whole front part of that piece with the little jagged insert in is. So it goes past there and across. Uh, and this is where that, that set sits, which you can see in the, you know, the aftermarket pieces for the 48 scale. So you have this kind of cut out for where the, uh, the uh, radio operator is actually sitting. And then at the front again, you know, you've got pilot seat, but you've got a headrest there, which isn't represented at all in the kit. So even when the, uh, the canopy is, is down, in the back that is, you don't see an awful lot maybe a little bit of stringing that's easy to recreate on this um, but it's mainly the seat and the, the radio pieces so I often find looking at what other people have done and look at aftermarket sets is often a good way of you know doing your initial research if nothing else that's not very useful, is it? You know, the actual cockpit, you know, that square representation, this is much more like a, a Spitfire um, type of yoke. You know, it's not a square. Again, the aftermarket kits will, will give you an idea of kind of what's in there. Here we've got radios. And this is not difficult to recreate, right? This is just a shelf, you know. This is a, an actual aircraft. You can see the exact same thing. So yeah, that shelf, if you think about it, came past the line of the cutout, so about here. And if you think 
where this is, you know, it's about there. So there's nothing there at all. Also, this piece, it goes in there, but it, it doesn't kind of go flush with the fuselage, I don't believe. It kind of sits in there, kind of floating. So actually we need a, another way to determine, you know, what is the shape of that piece? that's going to go there, which I'll probably do with, and I've shown this before on the uh, the Falk video, so what I did about uh, improving, well, I did several videos, I did three videos in a series, one was don't make these mistakes, <laughs> and then the second one was demonstrating how to fix those mistakes, the second and the third using the Caro um, Footwolf 187 Falk, Falcon. Really nice aircraft. Now, a couple of other things I think we can we can improve here. So obviously, you can't see it very well here, but you have a blanking plate, you know, which is obviously two halves. for the, I uh, presume, oil cooler. Uh, so there's no mesh or anything on that. And it's obviously got the line down it. Now I think we'll just use some fine mesh uh, just on the back of that. So that's very, very low, low tech. Um, how that actually compares to the real aircraft. I'll have to check before I do that, obviously. And then we've also got, you know, these pieces. Uh, they need drilling out because they weren't solid. <laughs> Those are obviously air intakes. Not quite sure what they're used for. Some sort of cooling process, I imagine. So the fit of this actually is pretty good. It's vague to actually get you know, sorted, but it looks pretty good. Yeah, more locating pins will probably help with um, you know, keeping that in while it dries, but it's not the end of the world. It is going to be making it a little bit harder, so probably we'll actually have to test fit, like make the piece out of plastic card for this, test fit it, and then glue it in one half you know, to bring this in. So I'll have to make sure it's the right size first um, before bringing it all together, which will be a bit of a pain, but hey, not too bad. Uh, for these, let's trim some of this. And that flash. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty easy plastic to work with. Now the question is, do we do anything about the thickness here? We probably do need to, to be honest, principally because this actually extends beyond this wing anyway, so it needs cutting back, which then leaves quite a thick, quite a thick piece. What is that? maybe one and a half millimeters. So if you think that is going to be a hundred millimeters, I mean, that's quite thick for a trailing edge, 10 centimeters, just a trailing edge is pretty thick. It's weird though, because it's mainly at one end. <laughs> uh, this needs a little bit of filling. 
the other thing is, of course, we can make it easier on ourselves because we do have rocket rails here and the rockets, which are obviously light rockets. These are not the, the heavier warheaded rockets because they're barely more than a stick. Yeah. Barely notice the warhead on those. I'm going to say we don't do those. <laughs> But we leave those off because I don't think they're adding uh, anything to the overall aircraft. I think they would actually be detracting from how the thing looks. The other thing is well, that hole in that one wheel is not centered, which is unfortunate. It's centered on this side, not centered on that one. Let's have a quick look at the instructions, because I think with the wheels, yeah, it says do not glue them. This is where you were supposed to heat the outer piece to push it down. We ain't going to be doing that. Um, So yeah, that's not too much of a problem that it's that it's not 100% centered because we'll probably actually fill that <laughs> and then push this over from the side and trim it um, so it's less of an issue because those are pretty pretty grim those holes anyway. And you've got some pretty enormous seam lines down those wheels as well. I mean, if you wanted to spend money, you could ask the market. Uh, you could do 3D printed. I don't think we need to do that on this. Um, I think I just noticed. Is that broken? I think one of the exhausts is broken there. Looks like it's just broken off just the tip of it. Might need to uh, fashion something there. Yeah, I think it's broken there as well. Just at the edge. These, oof, again, we could do with do with reducing in thickness at the back there on the control surfaces. Again, none of these things are necessary, but um, it'll just be a nicer model. So let's do a little bit of clean up on this fuselage. Now, of course, because it's raised panel lines, <coughs> that does mean that if we do any sanding, we're going to lose them. So we may actually in fact, almost certainly, I'll probably remove these anyway. And of course, what passes for ribbing detail are just lines. <laughs> That's it. You just get raised lines. There's no actual kind of fabric effect here at all. <clears throat> right, let me just uh, quickly look at the chat. I honestly don't know what a portable rock wall tester is, James. It's a hardness tester. It measures on the, I think it's the Mohs scale. It's uh, specifically, uh, you can get different ones. This is a, a D model, which is specifically for testing hard thermosetting um, plastics, which is exactly what these are. Uh, quick guy. Off topic, very sprue, new and old. Can be mixed for sprue glue or not? A clever idea. Uh, it can. Uh, you can You can mix, uh, as long as it's styrene, right, polystyrene. The only thing I would say is if you're mixing different types, um, you won't get consistency between batches, uh, if that matters to you. So 
it might have slightly different properties because the density of the styrene used and obviously the colors and stuff um but as long as it's it's polystyrene then um you know it's the same base material uh, there shouldn't be any problems so really as with most things the answer is it depends <laughs> i mean i've mixed uh, and it, again it depends on what sizes you're making your sprue glue right if you're making litre quantities it's not going to make any difference adding you know, a little bit of sprue from something else and it's not going to affect that mix um all right let's get these big pieces off their frames So as I don't actually have that thermo setting plastic with me, one of the other ways to do, you know, to find out the size of this, I mean, we, we know roughly because we've got this piece, right? So we know kind of where, you know, the, the ballpark we need to be in. So I'm going to cut a little bit. Longer and wider than we need. Where it needs to go, which of course is just that way. Um, right in here. Level of the let's do it that way. almost the right length so obviously if we use the thermosetting plastic uh, which is just like a, a moldable plastic you put it in boiling water it goes soft you mold it in it takes the form of whatever you've pressed it into and then you can just wait for it to cool pull it out and then use that to actually make your form from so that's sitting there it's going to go the other way actually because I think it's a little bit wider that way around of course this isn't quite straight so it needs a little bit of shaving off there. I mean, this is about as old school modeling as you can get, really, isn't it? Old 70s kit with plastic art. How it was done back in the day. So let's just tack that in place. actually glue straight
So we can actually, uh, let's, what are we going to use there? Let's use part of this. So I'm just going to use this part where we've got this, this kind of right angle piece. Right. I'm just going to use that as essentially a little bracket on the rear of this, just to hold it in place, give it some strength, just support it. Do one at both ends. Use the whole of that, why not? That keeps it at the right at the right angle, right? Just to to keep that in place. And when it's dry, I'll give it a little bit longer. Obviously, so you can put this back and then just trim it till it fits. Well, in this case, I actually need to add more. <laughs> okay, I thought I'd cut it too big, and I haven't. <laughs> So that actually fits perfectly at this side, and it's actually slightly short. Huh. Well, that actually makes this a lot easier, <laughs> because now I can just cut this a little shim piece. Yeah, like so. So I just got like an irregular triangle which I'm just going to put on the underside here with a little bit of Tamiya I should say liquid glue because it's not actually Tamiya extra thin This is again where it would help if there were actually some positive supporting lugs here. Uh, but then what I'm going to do, because that's actually just sort of glued onto the underneath, is I'm just sliding it along. It really would help if this was a little bit more positive in terms of fit. Otherwise, you need more hands, right? because I had to faff around for that so long that didn't work because this cemented too firmly too quickly 
I can fix that because I had the foresight to bring some contactor, which will give us a longer working time. And of course, the essential piece that you need with all <laughs> the contactor, and that is a lighter. <laughs> Get those toxic fumes going. Just to make sure that we've actually got a clear. So this will give us a bit longer working time here to actually put this um, shim piece. So what I'm doing, if you think about it, here we've got the, the main piece, we've got our little shim, and then as we so I'll put it proud, and then as we put the piece on, it'll push it into position, and that will give us the right dimensions. And then we can cut it out of slightly thicker. Uh, plastic card to give us a little bit more structure and we'll be good. So you can see I put that quite proud. Again, I'm kind of rushing pieces here that I would actually normally leave to dry. <laughs> but you get the idea. Oh, this The lack of alignment here is really doing my head in. Okay. And of course, we do need access to it, so this wouldn't work if we had a closed bottom completely but that is basically where we need to be like that so that is actually the correct size and shape now so we can pull that out And now we know that this is the correct size of the shelf, size and shape of the shelf that we need there. So I'm just going to remove this little bracket here because I don't want it getting in the way. We will probably reuse it, but not right now. So really quick and simple. Now, I do actually have some Aries resin radios, which I might use rather than these, because these I don't think, well, A, they don't look like radios <laughs> or anything, really. I don't think they're big enough. I don't think they're high enough. Um, and also, if we look at our... Piece here. Uh, where is it? Like here. You've only got one there. Now I don't know whether that's because one has been removed post war, but the things I've seen on like aftermarket sets as well. That's not right, is it? Don't seem to be that, you know. We've got this little cutout. We've got the big radio in front. You've got like little stuff back here, but you don't seem to have a whole lot here. You've got the same thing that certainly one big radio in front, which makes sense, right? And then the others, I don't know whether these are backup pieces or IFF direction finding stuff, batteries, not sure, but, um, this is obviously the main operational radio because that's where the guy is going to be looking at, right? I mean, these might be communication sets. You know, we don't need to actually look at it too much. But 
Okay, here we've got one big one that looks more like a battery. And you've got the big thing out here. You do have this circular thing on the side. Now we do have a little circular bit here, so we may repurpose that and just put it on the side of the shelf when we make the shelf. But that is the size and shape that we need. So let's get a, a little more robust plastic card. So this is 10 thou. This is uh, really thin, very flexible, it's useful for all kinds of things. Um, little shims and stuff this i think is 20 or 30 but a bit a bit more robust anyway so we can use this with our template piece Look at it slightly long because I think we're a little bit short previously. You can always take away if you need to. More difficult to add. So once you've scored plastic card, you should just be able to snap it out and throw it on the floor like I just did. And usually you can use like tweezers or pliers just to snap this out. I'm just trying to try and find my rough snippers, which I'm sure are here somewhere. Seem to have eluded me. Okay, then we use the single bladed ones I didn't really want to use. I don't want to twist these because that's the way you break them. So I'm just actually using it, using the score as a guide to cut them. There we go. So that should now be a nicely fitting shelf. And we are slightly long because I did cut it slightly long. But that's because I want a nice snug fit. So I'm just going to pair it back gradually. Maybe another little shim off here. So there we go. That's the shelf piece. So now I need to measure uh, where that cutout is along here so I can get that done properly and then I'll just drop a piece down from here and then a floor piece that I can actually attach the the seat to then that should meet up I'll make that floor piece in exactly the same way I'll make that out of again 20 or 30 thou Yeah, we're tight because we made that a little bit long deliberately. So we can just trim that back just a smidge. There we go. It needs a little bit, a little bit of trimming. I 
think. Oh, or maybe not. No, I think that's good. There we go. Maybe a little. I might just actually sand the rest of it just to get that. But that is the shelf along the, the level of the canopy. See, that is not that is not cemented at all, and that's you know, sitting at a nice, nice angle there. But I won't cement it until I've measured and cut out the piece where I'm going to actually put the, the seat in. And then I'll put the pieces in the radio at the front and whatever pieces here, and then it'll be on the ports, uh, yeah, port side, that little round piece, whatever it is. Now for this, apart from trimming off this flash, What I'll do here is I'm just going to blank this off because we've got a little bit of a, a recess. So I can use the 10 thou. I just want to blank off this, this back piece, this hole here. Um, and we have quite a bit. This looks short, actually, for the opening, really, the Firefly. But hey... I don't want to get into any structural kind of alterations to this kit. I just want to make the best of the kit that I can make um, rather than try and make it you know, an accurate rendition of a, a Firefly from scratch. <laughs> That's not the point of this. Um, but yeah, I just want to get rid of that, um, that slot. And the easiest way to do that is just blank it off with, with 10 thou and that will take it across me. I don't have to do any filling or anything. Um, then I might actually just do some basic stringing at the back here and put a little square of plastic art just rounded off for that headrest. That gives the basic detail. The basic detail you're going to see, you've got to think about how much effort you want to put into this for, for what return you're going to get for it. So this shelf I think is quite important because it hides a lot of the sins anyway of the kit. And the bits that you're going to be able to see are the seats in that piece and there. And this back wall, right? I'll make a basic instrument panel. I'll just paint black. You won't really see it. So it doesn't really matter much more than that. Um, and I may not even change that control column. Um, because what you can actually see of that is going to be minimal. And that is that will basically be the interior then. And that will have done, I think, everything we need to. So yeah, this once I've cut that piece out, I'll cement it in, make sure it's it's flush across. And then just sand this piece, test fit, sand, test fit, until it's where it needs to be. So it's nice and snug um, without pushing anything or leaving any gaps. And then you can cement it um, you know, in fully just with a bit of liquid poly when it, when it comes together. And we're going to do pretty much the same on the, on the seat side here. So I think for this one, this is useful to kind of give us where the floor level should be kind of in this. So it is really at the bottom here where this uh, tab ends. That is effectively the floor. So very easy for us to create a floor there we're going to go halfway just mark that so we need twice that width i don't have a ruler to hand i don't think so we'll do the old 
it's about right method. About that. <laughs> Go back to full view. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yes, I have been. <laughs> so this, I think, actually, I'm just going to glue at the bottom here, actually, in the wing root. Because that makes it a lot easier. And we've got, if you can see the wing root, we've got a nice like, flat piece that we can glue to. And you cannot tell that it is not straight in um, at the top. <laughs> Especially when this is all painted. You won't be able to tell at all. Uh, and then it also gives us leeway because we won't actually have to make it the right size as long as it goes into that on the other side. We're good. Which is, is it cheating? Yes. Is it acceptable? Absolutely. <laughs> Nobody said this had to be fair. It just has to work. Right. So it's not difficult to kind of improve an old kit in very basic terms without putting an awful lot of work in. Um, it's like, yeah, I'm using aftermarket seats, but you know, I haven't bought them specifically. Yes, you could buy them specifically. They don't cost a lot of money. If you didn't want to, you could repurpose seats from other kits, uh, or you could you know, make your own out of plastic card. Um, it's not going to have a huge impact on the on what you will see, you know. So any of those avenues is absolutely fine. Okay, so that, yeah, that works. <laughs> So that is not a problem. We have a floor. Um, so that blanks off any sort of look through to, you know, down into the depths, especially when we put a um, an instrument panel here, which I'll probably dig from the spares box. I'm sure I have a 70 second scale, like Spitfire instrument panel or something that can go there, because they will be very, very similar. I'm just going to take that out because I don't really need that. So just to show you before I, I finish here how these work, um, normally I would use a very sharp blade cutting these out, um, which is in fact what I'm going to do because this is not... <laughs> I would also normally cut on a hard surface. Oh, that blade is all corroded. But I have a cutting mat here, so that's what I'll use. So you want to use the sharpest blade you can because you want it to cut and not bend where the attachment points are on photo etch. So that minimizes the amount of cleanup you need to do on them. Because cleaning up photo etch is an, another thing that I absolutely hate. There we go. So then it's a matter of just folding this. So 
I have a couple of pairs of tweezers, which actually I know, well, not tweezers, they're pliers, they're flat nosed pliers. And I know I can, it's exactly the right width for this. Um, but if it's not, you can just do it a part at a time. So do one side, then the other side. But you just basically hold it. And obviously you want the edge of those right up to the line. And then you just fold it in. So I do have a couple of photo etch bending um, machines is the wrong word. Tools, I think, um, which I am tempted to try, actually, because I've never tried them. Uh, they came in a job a lot of stuff. Um, but before that, obviously, you do need to file off. You can see this tiny little, tiny little nubs here. I'm going to actually see if I can just cut it off. The new blade, typically it's sharp enough that you can take these off. But really, you should file them. But stainless steel versus etched brass is only going to end one way. The brass ain't winning. <laughs> It also doesn't do any favours to your, your blade, but you know, for the purposes of today, it's fine. Um, but then we actually have, you know, something that looks like a seat uh, and we'll pop in. It will sit at the same sort of height and stuff, you know, in both, but it'll look like a seat. Um, and then we can have our little etched seat belts you know just folded in and uh, that will add a lot to this so that's all the work I'm actually going to do on the on the cockpits um, or the um, crew stations I should call them really I think the rest of what I will do on this um, and again I'll do this later in the week is going to be on the outside here. So I think what I will do, we're going to lose this raised detail where we have to, to take these because this is going to need filling. You know, I don't think there's any shadow of a doubt that we will need to do filling on this. Maybe not on the fuselage so much, but these wings, absolutely certainly, will need some filling. Uh, you know, you have some pretty major, you know, that, that is beyond a panel line, <laughs> that is a canyon. Um, so I think what I'll actually do is we'll do some, some panel lining, some panel engraving. Because I don't think I've ever done that on the channel. Um, so yeah, a lot of sanding and uh, panel lining. Maybe even some riveting. Should we do some riveting? Try that too. Okay, I uh, just want to go back over the chat because I have uh, completely ignored it while I was doing all of that. I don't think there's been much coming in. Yeah, so I think the, I think Frog, again, for its time, I think Frog was actually a little bit ahead of the curve in many ways. I think where it really got the bad reputation, I think, because, you know, I can't speak much more broadly, um, but was the association with Novo, when he went to Novo, um, for sure. Um, because obviously the casting quality and the plastic they used in the old Soviet Union was not quite the same. Uh, so I don't know whether by association they got that or whether Airfix was just ubiquitous or it was just things like, you know, we've talked about like some of that, the fit of that back shelf thing was, was pretty rough. And, you know, these pin that you have at the front are fine but the fit here is really like you know nebulous i would use i think as a word uh, now how this comes in and how this looks afterwards i mean 
doesn't look too, too bad. I mean, pilots, yep, they're absolutely hideous. I wouldn't ever use those. Um, even the 70s, I think they look bad. So I can certainly see where people kind of question them, but I don't think they deserve perhaps the, the reputation that um, perhaps they have today. I think if you think about Rebel kits of the time, I mean, this is light years ahead of what some of Rebel... I mean, that Rebel, it's not even one... 72nd, it's like 187th or 192 scale or something. Um, the old V2 and uh, and the launcher. I remember as a child, that kit made me cry. <laughs> it was so bad. So bad. Um, yeah, I, I think this is going to look uh, quite nutty when it's done. So I'm going to leave it there. Um uh, let's see. I just want to make sure I go through that again. Thank you, Chris. Very much appreciated. And yes, I must remember to be more vigilant in switching over my screen. StreamYard is not great um, in kind of letting you know that kind of thing. As in, it doesn't at all. Um, uh, and yeah, I think I think you're right. I mean, I can't talk about the accuracy of this. I mean, to me, it looks overall pretty much like a firefly yes the simplifications you know you do have you know blanked off pieces and stuff but i mean i don't think it's worse than what other people were doing at the time like you say a little bit of extra time you know the skill set is not that high you know just using bits of plastic card um you know it's uh it's, and it's what you enjoy if you enjoy doing that it doesn't matter anyway right uh, this was a, a frog tooling. So as I say, this was tooled two years before this actual boxing in 72, and it was a new tool from frog. So, yeah, it is an accurate representation of, of frog in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing you probably won't see me do on the channel. A <laughs> ship with photo etch. I have a dragon, no, not dragon, an I Love Kit HMS Hood, 1700th scale. It's in the shop. You can see it online, I think. Uh, it's £50. Pounds, right? The box is kind of this big, I think. You know, it's about that thick. Um, I had a look inside because it, it's not sealed or anything. Oh my God, it's got it's got a, a real wood deck, um, which is the th thinnest wood I've ever seen. I, I just don't know even how they do it. Like, I don't know, 0.2 of a millimetre or something. It has, I think, seven photo etch sprues or three massive ones or something. It's got, it has turned brass barrels for all of the, the primary and secondary armament. So not just like the big, whatever, what did it have? 15 inch guns on the hood? Can't remember. 12 or 15 inch, something like that. Um, but all of the like six inch guns they're like less than a centimeter long and they're just i mean it would look amazing i'm sure when you did it but oh my god <laughs> it's like i mean you're getting you know 50 pounds is quite a lot um and it's i mean it's more than that rp i can't remember what it is but um um yeah it, it's just i mean you're going to get your time worth of money doing that kit because i don't know how long it would take but yeah 15 inch um, primary and 5.5 inch secondary. Thank you. Generally, World War II battleships, they were all between 12 and 15 inch main guns, and then, um, you know, around six inch gun secondaries, and then a whole host of other stuff, um, which is mad, right? Because if you think a six inch gun <laughs> is like, a, what, what's that, 150 millimeters? Um, and if you think a tank at the time, World War II, you know, the biggest tanks were sporting 128 millimeters by the end of the war, the Yang Tiger and stuff, two part ammo, and they're just like nothing on the ship. <laughs> but yeah, the. Um, yeah, it's it's very similar. So I say it's 1700th, the, um, the I Love Kit one. Um, but good God, it's just got so much stuff. Um, one three, you see, one three hundred and fiftieth scale. It's at least 
visible. <laughs> um, I did see a, a video I posted on our little Discord, uh, private Discord that we have, um, for a 172nd scale Yamato. Uh, this guy had made it, um, and it occupies the entirety of this garage. It's just absolutely, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, it's radio controlled, it works, it goes on water and stuff. But oh my God, I mean, how long it must have taken to build? I don't know, but it looked fantastic. But geez, um, you know, that's manageable. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for joining tonight. Thank you so much, Vistrom, for sending this kit. Um, hopefully, I've showed that one, you know, Frog was pretty good in its day uh, in many ways, you know, ahead of its time in the, some of its thinking. Um, shame it wasn't around really for, for very long, you know. Um, I think it was. When they doing injection molding, I think in 55, I think they did their first kits, 55 to 76, 19 years. It's not that long uh, as a brand. But, um, yeah, obviously very much of its time in some ways, but some pretty nice casting. And, you know, with a little bit of time, some basic skills, a couple of extra little bits, I think you can you know, massively lift uh, a kit like this from 1974 standard to something that you know is that we're more used to seeing in the 21st century let's say anyway with that have a great rest of your weekend whatever of, of it is left um please join us if you're able to on ethics and chill tomorrow we have a guest from ethics coming in uh moss has managed to secure with his um privileged status and contacts uh, so that should be a good discussion tomorrow night uh, from 8 o'clock UK time. And uh, hopefully I will see you again in the week. I will be putting uh, a couple more streams together, uh, revisiting the Firefly and coming back on a couple of other projects. So hopefully you'll join us for that as well. Until then, take care and see you soon. Bye now.